Okay, I think we will get started. I want to welcome everyone to our program today. My name is Judy Margles. I am the director at the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. You are in for a treat today as we are going to hear from our exceptional panelists, each of whom are going to share their insights and expertise about artist and minimalist composer Harley Gaber and our current exhibition, Die Plaga. Included in the mission of the Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education is a challenge to resist indifference and discrimination and to envision a just and inclusive world. This imperatively drives us to teach our audiences that we can have that we have a responsibility to one another and that apathy, passivity, and inaction to injustice can result in public disaster. So one of the ways that we fulfill these pursuits is through programs like this that allow us to look intently at historic issues germane to the challenges we face today. Gaber's canvases, if you haven't seen the exhibition, but you are sure going to learn today, provide us with opportunities to think about issues such as extreme nationalism, media literacy, propaganda, and so much more. I just would ask that you check our website. Um, I think Amber can put our website in the um, chat, but check our website for other programs related to this exhibition, other programs that we're going to be offering. We're offering workshops, programs, tours in December and January, and it will all culminate on January 22nd in commemoration of International Holocaust Remembrance Day, where we're going to do a concert and feature some of Harley Gaber's music. So today I'm just very, very pleased to be joined by our exhibition's guest curator, Melissa Martins Yaberbaum, who's going to moderate today's program. Melissa is joined by Dan Epstein, whose family foundation manages the body of work and who has so generously supported this exhibition. In addition, there will be Steve Reese, an educator and close family friend of Harley Gaber, and Jock Reynolds, the Henry Hines II Director Emeritus of the Yale University Art Gallery. The format of today's conversation will be converse, uh, conversation of, uh, amongst our panelists, and we do want to hear from all of you. Please put your questions in the Q&A tab. We're going to endeavor to answer as many as possible. So now it's just my great pleasure to introduce Melissa Martins Yaberbaum. In one of Melissa's day jobs, I think she has many, she serves as the executive director of the Council of American Jewish Museums, where she concentrates on areas of next practice, strategic alliances, and museums as change agents. Previously, she served as the Director of Collections and Exhibitions at the Museum of Jewish Heritage. She was a curator at the Jewish Museum of Maryland and curator of the James Adams, the Jane Adam, Adams Hell House Museum in Chicago. In addition to Die Plaga, Melissa has curated many exhibitions about Jewish culture and history, including the enchanting project Mahjong, which we hosted in 2011. So with great pleasure, I'm gonna hand the program over to Melissa. Thank you so much, Judy. And it's such a pleasure to be here today. I am such a longtime fan of Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. I've had the pleasure of seeing the museum grow throughout three different museum sites over the years, and they were indeed just such a perfect fit for this project. So when I first heard about the work of Harley Gaber, it was from Dan Epstein, who we'll hear from in just a moment. And the first thing I suggested was that he contact a small handful of colleagues, including Judy Margles, knowing what exceptional work the museum does and how its mission is so aligned with this work. At first glance, and maybe some of you have seen this um, in, in the publicity images, it is certainly a piece of work that sheds light on the Holocaust, but I'm going to start off today's conversation by saying that the work was not intended to be just about the Holocaust, that in fact, all of the themes that we wrestle with as citizens, as people of the 21st century, as people that are moving through the plagues of our own times, that this work really kicks up a lot of those themes. And we'll see how it's not only a product of Harley's times, but a product for our times. So with that being said, um, I've, you've now heard who I am, and I'd like you to have a chance to hear more from our other panelists, um, who they are, and how they knew Harley or his work. So we'll get started with Dan Epstein. Take it away, Dan. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Melissa. I appreciate it. Um, 
So I'm Dan Epstein. Um, I'm based in Chicago. Uh, my family foundation, the Epstein Family Foundation, uh, owns the work and co-manages it with Steve Reese. Um, I, my background with Harley goes way, way back to when I was very young. Our parents were very, very good friends. We went to the same high school together. I was best friends with his younger brother, Dan. Uh, and essentially uh, we lived about a block away from Harley and I was in their house all the time. Uh, he, was, he was a terrific uh, and a very uh, unusual and exceptional person even back then, uh, a spectacular athlete. Uh, he was captain of the football team and all America played tennis in addition to being very artistic. Uh, and I, I knew him uh, mostly at that time and we reconnected much later in life around 2010 uh, when my mom passed away, he, he reached out to me at that time. We had had contact prior to that. He was in Chicago from time to time visiting and he would contact me, but uh, he reached out to send his condolences to me. And that led to a commission, uh, a piece that he wrote in honor of the memory of my mom called In Memoriam 2010, which I think was the last major work that Harley composed. And uh, so we, we that uh, ignited a sort of reignited, I guess, the relationship at that time, which was just prior to before he passed away and uh, became aware pretty much around that time of De Plaga. I, I did not know much about De Plaga uh, prior to that. I know Steve, Steve is really much knowledgeable about that time when he was creating in late in early 1990 to 2000, two or three. Uh, so uh, that's how I know Harley and uh, became involved with Deplaga actually through Steve, who contacted me, as I recall, uh, just after Harley had passed away. And uh, we started discussing what to do uh, with uh, Deplaga, which at that time was stored in a small self-storage uh, facility in Oregon. Uh, and we didn't know a lot about it. We didn't know how many canvases there were. We didn't, uh, we, we began to learn all that. And Steve, I think can probably take it from here in terms of uh, his relationship and how we then became more involved in managing the project. Great, go ahead, Steve. Tell us um, how you knew Harley and also what do people need to know about Harley Gaber? If they've never heard the name Harley Gaber, who was he? Well, that's too big a question. I'll start with the small answer answerable ones. Um, I knew Harley in, uh, also through family. Um, my folks were friends with his folks and his mom and my mom were were pals, uh, but my dad and, and Harley's dad, George, were best friends. Um, there were a couple of South Side Chicago fellows who were hanging out with a bunch of North Shore uh, Jews who'd migrated from Chicago to the Bay Area, and the South Side guys tended to stick together. Um, so I met Harley when I was young, but we didn't hit it off as friends until much, much later. Uh, and because I was uh, around and about Harley while he was making the work, which he did from 93 to 2002, um, I had the good fortune to watch it evolve as he moved from uh, studio to studio. And the fun in all this was in watching Harley's vision of the work change and interacting uh, with uh, visitors who would walk by his studios, the first several of which had glass, nothing but uh, open windows facing either the street or an internal walkway within a hotel where he was first doing the work in what turned out to be an old gift shop. And people would stop and uh, peek in and ask to speak to him. So um, Harley was actually talking to uh, visitors before the work ever got exhibited. And I got to watch all this unfold. It was so much fun. Um, but um, to tackle the bigger question, Melissa, the harder one you asked me, um, Har Harley was uh, 
unusual in both how tenacious he was with everything he wrestled with. He liked to wrestle with um, a, a few things that were fun, but he tackled them with such incredible ferocity. It was kind of scary. This includes uh, billiards and tennis. And uh, the things he did for fun uh, w w didn't look like fun the way he attacked them. It was like incredibly intense. He also had a pattern of uh, uh, getting really good at something like football, uh, Dan, if you remember, and then he'd quit completely because it was no longer interesting. Harley liked to wrestle with the uh, tough stuff. And I think uh, tackling the subject matter of De Plaga uh, ca came to him uh, for reasons uh, that had to do with both his Jewish, the home he grew up in, to um, the Buddhist uh, spiritual path that he chose for himself, and three, his uh, having open ears to the audio environment around him, especially in the 90s, which was filled in California with right-wing talk radio. And he listened to Rush Limbaugh a lot and listened to a lot of vitriol about immigrants. Um, and I think uh, Harley resonated with this in a, a remarkable way. And one other personal factor about Harley that's worth sharing um, is that his Buddhist beliefs led him to believe that he'd been re reincarnated uh, from a, a prior life. And the prior life he believed he'd led was as a German young man in the First World War who died in trench warfare in the face of machine gun fire. So Harley's deep, deep interest in Germany also had this spiritual dimension, which um, he talked about and like his microtonal minimal music, I never understood, but it was a real big driver for him and what caused him to uh, continue through this work. Thank you. Jacques, I'm gonna ask you now who you know Harley through his work, um, both to introduce us to the type of visual work he produced, um, how that fits in the canon of his overall repertoire from his life, music composition, through visual arts. Where, where, how do you know and understand this work and how have you made sense of it and made sense yeah. of Harley Gaber? Yeah, well, I, I was reconnected to Steve by my other UC Santa Cruz classmate, Peter, Jones, who knew me and my wife very well. We we're both artists. And even though I became a museum director, uh, most people in the West Coast still think of me and my wife as artists. And we worked extensively with photographic archives and the work we have done. And we've twice actually done pieces based on the Holocaust. One worked with images from the Warsaw Ghetto and in the National Archives in Washington, uh, the uh, um, Hitler's wonderful lady friend on top, Eva Brown, her photographs from the Berchtesgarten are they are showing the most incredibly decadent life they were living during World War II. And we were often juxtaposing images around the Holocaust and projects we did much in the way I found Gaber's work fascinating when I encountered it. I had also had the profound experience of being taken to Dachau between my ninth birthday by my father, who was a young high school student had won the German prize uh, before he went to Harvard. And in those days, 1938, you can imagine what was brewing in, in uh, Germany at the time. And my father was sent to what was the elite prep school in Germany, the Solemschule with five other Americans. But when they got to Germany, it was closed and they were sent to Feldefing in, in Bavaria, which was the elite training uh, school for Nazi youth right near Munich. And some of the very images that uh, Harley used in his work are very reminiscent of the, the, the stories and the images my father shared with me. He was there for three months and even Hitler and Mussolini came and introduced themselves to the students. These were gonna be the great leaders of the Nazi uh, um, you know, Reich. And interestingly, my father got into trouble because he started objecting to the way Jewish people were taught to look like and what was wrong with them. And he he went into Munich one day, instead of saying Heil Hitler, he was observed saying Gruß Gott. And the headmaster said, you're in for big trouble. You've been causing trouble already and you're gonna be disciplined tomorrow. And my father and one other guy got on bicycles and fled to Switzerland that night. So I was taken to Dachau by my father when he came back to have a Guggenheim in Switzerland in 19. 
56, and I'll never forget the experience of that. So when I was brought to the attention of Harley's work, it was work that I was very familiar with. And I have to say what I've been thinking about since leaving Oregon is the incredible level of war crimes that are being perpetrated on the Ukrainian people now by Putin and Russia. I mean, we're seeing another kind of, you know, Holocaust going, you know, trying to basically bring them to their knees by going after the civilian populations, bombing them in all these ways. And, and, and at the same time, we've had the relief in the last week of seeing our own country back off a bit from its fascistic tendencies. So thinking about Harley's work in the context of all this is just incredibly interesting right now. And I can't imagine that this body of work isn't going to sustain a, uh, a lot more attention in the years to come because it's only been a small group of the 2,000 and uh, 4,200 images that you selected. And I'd love to have you say a little bit about your selection because I think it was brilliant. <laughs> and those of us who came out to see the installation thought it could not have been done better. Would you say something about your own work as curators? Because I think it's fabulous. Oh, thank you so much, Jack. I, we will we will get there. I think um, I'm going to show some slides in a few minutes on the half hour, and I'll get to um, describe the, the images selected and the experience of the exhibit. But let's take a moment to give everyone a better sense of the work Diplaga. Yeah. Um, let's assume that there might be some people on our program today that have already been to the exhibit or know something about the work, but we're going to assume for the moment that most of the audience does not know the work. And mm -hmm. it would be impossible even for the people on this call to say they know every canvas of the work because mm -hmm. there's more than 4,200 canvases. So except for Harley and possibly his partner at the time, Christina, um, it, there, there's no one in the world who can say they know the whole work. But let's try to fill people in on what the work is, what it represents, and what we think Harley intended. So who, who wants to take a first pass at, at describing the work Diplaga? What it is, what, what was Harley trying to express? Maybe it would make sense, Melissa, if I may, to give a little uh, historical background of how we came to know what was what comprised Diplaga. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I alluded to it in my earlier comments, but when, when uh, Steve and I started thinking about Diplaga, he knew he, of course, because as he described, he was, a, he was witness to him creating it. He had seen early exhibits of the work in 2000. And we should call your attention to the fact, call everyone's attention that there were exhibits uh, uh, in the early 2000s, but uh, the Oregon exhibit is the first exhibit uh, in, a, in over 20 years since he passed away. So as I had mentioned, uh, the, the work was uh, housed in a small non-climate controlled self-storage unit in I think Newport, Oregon, and where he had nearby where he had been working. And we, we tried to first uh, have a physical, one of uh, Steve's friends went and took a look inside the unit to see what he could see. And we were estimating the number of canvases that were there. We thought there were a little over 2000 canvases, uh, some of which had been razored out of, many of which had been razored out of their frames and stacked uh, as, as canvases. Others remained in the frames about half and half, as we later discussed, discovered. Um, we knew we'd been having discussions with museums, but we realized that we really didn't know much uh, in any concrete way what, the, what, was, what was really comprising the, the work of art. So we had discussions with Steve Gaber, who was uh, the executor of Harley's estate, where the piece after his pa he had passed away, that's who owned it. And uh, Steve agreed to gift it, gift the whole work to my foundation to allow us to start investing capital and time to really uncover the mystery. We then had the whole work shipped 
to a group that um, that uh, Jacques referred to, headed by Mac Holberg, called Art Authority, also in Oregon. These were absolutely the premier, uh, probably digital art producers in, in the country. They, I believe, also had come from the Getty Museum as well. And we commissioned them to photograph, to do high resolution photographs of every canvas with, uh, cat and then catalog the numbers so we would have numbers and put condition reports and so on. So that took several months. When that was completed, we then knew that we had somewhere over 4,200 canvases. We had high resolution images uh, of each canvas, including blank canvases. We had condition reports and each one was numbered, which opened a whole new door for us to really begin to analyze and understand the work, including uh, smaller parts of the work called mural, which we call murals, which are self-contained uh, pieces within the bigger work, uh, which is what, what's on exhibit in Oregon, which are sort of self-contained, um, uh, self-standing, uh, much smaller parts of, and consisting of maybe 100 to 300 canvases at a time. So that's how we, and that, that all of that, all those images have, have been placed on a, a portal called Art Table. So we can access or others can access and see every single image online um, and it enables the curation of the work too, because someone like you now, as you well know, you had access to our table in putting this together. So that's so, a little bit of the background of- Dan, Dan could, could, I, could I jump in and talk uh, sure. more, more directly to Melissa's question about the what the it is? And yeah. what he what he intended, and then I'm going to leave time for Jock. We've got seven minutes, I think, for this section. So um, th th this is a art historical narrative about Germany. Harley was emphatic about this, um, and it and it ranges from Weimar, 1918, the end of the First War, all the way to the end of the Second War and the end of the Third Reich, and. Just as Timothy Snyder has argued with historians in reinterpreting what the uh, rise of fascism in the bloc countries uh, re what made, made possible and how it came about, and in that way reinterpreted what um, we call the Holocaust to have been, he's been, just as Timothy Snyder argued with fellow historians, I think Harley was picking a fight. I think he was arguing with other artists as well as with uh, Jews who wanted to say, I know the Holocaust, it happened to me, I'm going to tell you what it was. And Harley wanted to get people to release their grasp of possession of uh, these events and to look at the interaction of individuals swept up in the whirlwind of history. And Harley's argumentativeness is something um, I enjoyed, and our friendship came a lot about like his boys would with arguing and hitting each other. So he'd come over for dinner and he'd assert something and uh, I'd often disagree because um, I didn't see history evolving the way Harley did. Uh, I, I didn't have a Buddhist spiritual path and I thought of interaction of people and history differently than Harley. But I think it's uh, helpful to be able to understand that his approach to recomposing photographic images taken by people in their times makes it possible for him to have an argument with artifacts from which he made the art that is the work that is an argument. And that argument um, has led him to walk away from invitations to exhibit and it's a uh, 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 led him to spend the better part of dinners at our house, having a, a good, healthy dis disagreement about what the heck he was doing. But um, I think that helps give people a sense of this, the reason why Harley didn't intend to make a Holocaust artwork. He intended to have an argument primarily. Jock, I'd love to hear your thoughts here. Jock, you're muted. You're muted. Right? How's that? Can you hear me again? Now we can hear you. Okay. 
Yeah, that's that's an interesting contention, Steve, because when I came and looked at all this work, you know, it just struck me, having been at Dachau myself, and I know that he went to Dachau and Buchenwald, as well as, you know, juxtaposing these images from many more banal circumstances, as well as horrific ones, that he put this thing together in a very, very provocative way, of which we've just seen a little bit. And given what you've said about him, I just wonder, you know, what are we going to find out if we go deeper and deeper into the sheer hugeness of this uh, experience he's put forth for us? Because as I saw what you put forth, Judy, with your great uh, exhibition, I also saw on that back wall these smaller collages that reminded me much more of the work of someone like John Hartfield and others that made me think that he was producing one kind of experience that you maybe have produced in a magnificent way at Portland. But I would say it would be very easy to want to collect some of those other images just singularly. They're so complex and some of them are at a very different scale. And here at Yale, we've collected the work of George Gross and Anselm Kiefer and Hartfield and others. And, you know, one wants to really be able to see how this work might get seen and distributed more broadly in the world. I know, Dan, that's a hope for you and your foundation that the work can be seen in more different venues and different complexities. But I think, you know, to just think that these are gonna be housed somewhere 4,200 things in one place is not really the fate they deserve. Beyond the exhibition, where does the work reside in deeper in time is something that I think about a lot as a museum director who has been very involved in teaching and thinks these have incredible uh, resources for people to learn and teach with. So I'm curious how you, our wonderful uh, moderator and curator, how did you think about that? Because you're deeply involved in education. What was, what was your thinking as a curator when you put together the offering we see in Portland, which I think is just outstanding? Well, thank you. That's what we're about to jump into here. That um, first of all, I even though I've seen a lot of work um, over several decades at Jewish museums in particular, I have never seen a work like this before. And there are, in fact, so many different chapters. Harley Gaber himself was a renowned composer, uh, minimalist composer. And so the, the depth of the work here and the, the different possibilities and avenues for interpretation are very rich. Um, what I'll do now is I'll show you all um, some of the photos from the installation at Oregon Jewish Museum and Center for Holocaust Education. And this is only up to about 400 canvases in the entirety for this installation. So it's approximately one tenth of the work. So you could only imagine the other riches and, and the other resources available in the work itself. So be patient with me while I share my screen and I'll go to full screen. And you should all now be stepping into the exhibition Die Plaga at Oregon Jewish Museum. Um, as you could see, I think that um, this installation shot is very true to form, both of what it looks like in person and also based on other prior installations that Harley supervised himself. Um, I had seen several other installation shots from installations in the 1990s. And the, the overall sense you get when you walk into the work is that you could look at it close up and you can also step back. I think um, Harley would have asked us to step back be first before looking close up. That's my hypothesis that um, so much of the work is um, like pointillism, really um, showing a composite of imagery. A lot of it, um, and Steve used the phrase, individuals swept into the course of history. And I think that that phrase so adequately describes what Harley intended and what his partner, Christina Ankowska, who's also an artist described from the 1990s and into the early 2000s when the work was being created, that um, even if from this vantage point, you all viewers are not seeing a tremendous amount of detail, you're getting the sense of like almost like a tidal wave of historical events unfolding in front of you. There's tremendous energy to these images. So one of the first things we wanted to do with this installation was to, um, 
give that sense of that artist's intent and to also kind of pan back and show, um, show that this is something you step into. And it really feels that way. It feels like a very immersive, all encompassing experience when you walk in. Yet at the same time, this particular gallery has all those windows letting in the light. Um, it's a very beautiful design um, by uh, Brian Potter as an associates design company. It's, um, it's, it's really modern and it certainly, um, it looks like something you might expect to see at a museum that does Holocaust education, and yet it's contemporary art at the same time and, and very contemporary looking. So um, that's some of the, the first impressions of the show. Um, some of these photos are from the opening week. This is um, uh, Harley's brother, Steve, and also Bruce. Um, his stepbrother, and they are in front of the opening panel that describes who Harley Gaber is, um, who he was as an artist, who he was as a person, the scope of his life, the decades into which he was born. I think something that's really interesting about this work is that um, so many people, and I'm sure people watching this program, grew up in a world that had many Holocaust survivors, particularly if you were in um, urban centers and other communities where many Holocaust survivors resided. And so we've had the honor and the privilege of living alongside survivors as part of the fabric of society. And we've also come to understand Holocaust as a chapter of the, the 20th century, a horrific chapter that informed everything that came after. And though Harley Gaber is not a Holocaust survivor, is not a descendant of Holocaust survivors, was not an American Jewish GI in World War II, um, he was born in the 1940s. So his life spans those decades immediately following the Holocaust and also America's understanding and coming to terms with the Holocaust, us as Americans, American Jews, and the world stage. And so I think that even though Harley, um, as came up earlier in this conversation, would not have said explicitly that his Jewish background informed this work, um, I think his um, keen observation skills were definitely informed. Um, by the fact that he was a Jewish, a Jewish creative that was born in the 1940s. Um, so a lot of this work to me points to more of a 21st century understanding than a 20th century one. And we know that that its creation goes into the, the early 21st century. So it's not, it doesn't read to me as a piece of the 20th century. It reads to me as a piece of the 21st century in that it's how do we come to terms with the events of our own lifetime and what we've been witness to. Um, so a lot of what we wanted to tease out in the exhibit was not only using this as another entry point into Holocaust education, but also raising those themes for our own times. So one thing we um, wanted to do, and it's a subtle gesture, but a lot of the powerful questions underlying this version of the exhibition are in these conversational pylons. You see these black blocks in the middle of the gallery room, and they tease out the questions as is relevant to our own times, um, such as for the nation, what is it we as individuals are willing to do for our country? Where is the line blurred between um, loyalty to one's country of origin and extreme nationalism. And we're seeing those forces play out. Um, we've just had the elections. We're seeing it play out in, in our own country and across the world is um, how do we navigate that as individuals and what, what the answer is and what will be the repercussions in terms of the way we answer those questions. Um, we also tease out conversational prompts in terms of um, what, what do we owe to children in a time of multiple plagues? Um, it's interesting, this piece, even though a lot of people would say it's about Germany and the period overlapping the Holocaust immediately before, during, and after, that it's called Die Plaga. So I think Harley very clearly intended for us to, 
to see the piece, but to see it as pointing to something larger, um, as Steve was describing. Um, so we've just all lived through um, one plague that is still with us. And we're also plagued by many, many other dark forces in society and around the globe. We also ask the question of um, how do we piece together the images of our own times? Um, how do we digest media images? What do we record and save? Um, how does our own mind scramble them? And how do we redigest them and send them back out to the world? For a lot of people that's being done on social media, but we're all the own visual authors of our life and our times. And what is the record that we leave behind? Um, so a lot of these questions are not just particular to this time period, are not just particular to this artwork, but I think are really great conversation starters, um, a really great place, Jacques, you were saying, for education, and how do we use um, Harley's intent and his art to bring us into conversations that we might not have had otherwise. Um, zooming in for a moment, though, there is fantastic detail. First of all, the, um, the level of artistry and the way in which the materials are handled is exquisite. Um, even though this is the form of collage, everything is cut and, and put together compositionally um, with extreme care and precision. Um, everything was executed with a very, very clear intent. And some of the details are, are so moving and, and upsetting too. On the one hand, we see children here, um, those that are young members of the Reich, and we also see um, immigrants that are being, being sent away. And so these are probably Jewish um, children that are being sent out of Germany, and we know um, what their likely fate is. And so it just shows you could be standing in either um, place in history, and you don't always get to pick your place in history. And one of the things I think Harley Gaber wanted us to think about was that, um, is not to think just about people that are born as good guys or bad guys, but that we are all swept into these big events, and then we have choice within that. Um, looking at the rest of the exhibit, this is a little bit of a bird's eye view, so it gives you a sense of the overall footprint, which certainly wouldn't need to be the same in, in future installations, but gives you a sense of the installation at Oregon Jewish Museum. If you turn the corner, you see other installations, um, and we have a wall called We Are All Collages, and we use this as a way to get to know the many different forces that shaped Harley's life and career and the different ways in which he expressed himself and to also um, suggest that we all, the visitors, are also collages that are made up of many different ingredients. We get to know a lot here biographically about Harley. Um, there are original, there's an original film by him here. There's also footage of him working in the studio and creating Deplog. There's some of the individual canvases, one of the hats that he wore um, almost all of the time, uh, and some fantastic photographs that show the scope of the work from its beginning through its ultimate um, uh, dismantling. Um, by the time Harley decided to stop working on it, he realized the scale of the work was so big that it probably could not be housed or shown by one singular institution. And um, so he started to put it away carefully in storage, but out of frustration, he also removed some of the canvases, um, some very, most very carefully and others out of frustration. But the vast majority of the canvases, of course, do survive. Um, this final installation shot from the opening also brings us back to the sense of being enveloped um, by the work itself. The um, pieces that we chose to highlight for this installation touch particularly on the themes that I addressed. Um, we focused on those that come together as narrative murals um, and point a lot to refugees, to um, childhood in a time of war, to um, the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising, to the clashes of the of World War II and the Holocaust, and eventually also to a fragmented society and individuals that are, are left more on their own. So those are some of the themes we chose to pull out in, in the uh, murals, but there are really endless stories 
such as, as Jock says, that if anyone else was going to recreate um, this installation, they could build upon the themes certainly that we lay out here, but there are many, many other possibilities. And that's one of the reasons it was so thrilling to work with. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, I'm gonna bring us back to a key question for all of us here, which is um, what relevance does this work have today? I think we've all touched on it, but um, how do you see this as being, I see it as being even more relevant now than it would have been 20 years ago in the first years it was created. I think um, Harley's engagement with the material, some of which he sourced directly from Germany and his many trips to concentration camps and to German archives, um, that he came to a place with the work of evolving it to make a very big statement. And I think by the time the work is completed, it says something very different um, and it says something even more different and compelling to, to me now as, a, as an individual living in the 2020s. But let's have a chance to hear from everybody. Dan, I'm gonna ask you to jump in. I think you're on mute. There you go. I agree with you 100%. In fact, I have said that in the brochure that I think that the Plaga is as much, if not more, about the present and the future than it is about the past. I think following on some of the things that Steve said and Jock, that Harley believed that the characteristics that allowed or enabled the evil of the Holocaust to occur are immutable. Uh, I think those were his words, that, that this is not a temporary event in effect or a temporary force within human nature. This is permanent. This is embedded in human nature. And I think um, while he, he wasn't advocating, as Steve pointed out, it was, it was an argument, but I think he was making a statement to be vigilant in a sense that because this, we have this force within human nature that can create this kind of evil, that we need to be vigilant and watch out and nothing could be more relevant. And he's, I think he's absolutely right. And th that's the relevance for today. We see it in front of our eyes uh, happening uh, all over the Europe and, and the world and including the United States uh, with what's been going on with uh, the, 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 what, really is looks like a fascist playbook, frankly, among the, the right, you know, the very right wing extremists and, and racism and so on. So I think it's, uh, I think it very much, that's why I think uh, it was so important to bring it back into public view. Our mm -hmm. goal uh, and the project, if you will, the project is to uh, have exposure of this uh, in the right places and to really bring people's attention to this, uh, this view and uh, hopefully, and with the artistic creation behind it and the beauty, the, I know it's hard to call it beautiful sometimes, but it really is uh -huh. the photo montage and the, the breadth of it, I think really goes to describing what uh, some of the real issues that face us today. Great. You know, one I'm going to ask you to jump in. Yeah, one of the things I've been thinking about is, you know, this the way, how do we transfer knowledge and caring across generations? You know, so much of, we're, we're at a point where the last of the World War II veterans and the last of the Holocaust survivors are passing, you know, they're passing into death. And, and so now we don't have these first witnesses with us anymore. And so I've been thinking a lot about how we transfer knowledge and experience to subsequent uh, you know, generations. And the one image that really came to my mind after I got back was not the experience my father had given me as when I was young, taking me to Dachau, but an experience I had much later with my father-in-law who happened to have graduated from Yale in 1940 as the head of his ROTC class. 
into officer school training and was sent to land on Omaha Beach as an artillery officer and fight all the way to the Elba, Elba River and stop so the Russians could go in and take Berlin. And for the 50th anniversary of the Normandy landing, he said, I want to take all of you, his wonderful daughter, to whom I'm married, myself and our grandchildren. I want you to come to the reunion of all of us who are having an in Omaha of the, of the Normandy invasion. And what do you think he did once we got there? We, we went to the beach, which looks so peaceful, but what he wanted to first do, he took us to every one of the graveyards, first to the American graveyard, where we stopped at a grave of a 23 year old private who had been his Jeep driver. Their Jeep was hit by a shell, killed his driver, but not him. Why did I survive to have this family and I lost this beautiful young man? Uh, those questions. We went then to the English cemetery. We went to the Canadian cemetery. And where did he take us to last? The German cemetery. That was a huge sense of seriality, much like Harley's work, where you saw tombstone after tombstone for all these nationalities. And when he got to the German cemetery, what did he want to point out to us? the age of most of the people who had died. They were 13, 14, 15 years old. That alone was so unbelievable and horrifying to us that we had never really thought about it that way. Harley's work to me brings that same emotional gut punch to you in the way he presents images. And in the, in the fact that how it affected my father-in-law is he came back from that the most anti-war person, anti-violence person you can imagine, who objected very strongly to the Vietnam uh, War, took his two uh, sons to, to Canada and left until things changed. These things really affect the lives across generations and how artwork and how experiences of, of real places and important cultural material can be shared is really important. And this is what I think Harley's piece is is really a piece of monumental consequence. And we've just begun to see what it can do. Wonderful. Steve, what is it you want people to think about moving forward and how this piece speaks to our times? Well, I wanna just speak about the scale of the work and my watching people uh, in prior shows, particularly the first exhibit at a community college south of San Diego, um, where the work was mounted as you mounted it in Portland, uh, Oregon Museum of Jewish History. Um, five up, it rises about 12 feet high. Um, many of the images are close to human scale. So as you're walking by it, you're making eye contact with people who uh, are looking at you in many cases. One of the panels, um, I'm sorry you didn't get to that detail shot, have a, a group of figures at the top who are looking out at you. But for the kids who come to visit, that uh, row of Hitler Jugend and the row of uh, Jewish kids in wool overcoats and yellow stars are gonna be their height and they're gonna be looking at them. And I can't wait for uh, one of the museum staff to uh, try and do a debrief with those kids to find out if they felt that, that, that those kids were talking to them. And yeah. uh, I'll, I'll just add one other anecdote about my own political coming of age. And that is, it, it, uh, Jock mentioned 1956. In 1956, I was looking at Life magazine photographs of the uh, a Russian invasion of uh, Hungary and fighting in the streets of Budapest. And I'd been reading Leon Uris and um, uh, listening to my parents' conversations about uh, the second war and the Holocaust and uh, their support of the state of Israel in light of the fact that Jews had nowhere to go. And I thought to myself, man, what would I have done then and there? And th that, that question lasted uh, with me for uh, for the rest of my life. And I, I can't help but think the scale of that work enables uh, people from that time and place to look at visitors to the museum who are surrounded everywhere they look by the events of that time in an incredible density. Mm -hmm. And 
pose the question to them, oh my God, if I were there, what would I do? Mm-hmm. So I, I, I think that's the power of the work. Yeah. Yeah, you know, the other thing, I think a lot of us who uh, came of age when Steve, you and I did, was we, we also at that point had the last of the Shah's students from Iran were in America. And I taught a lot of them. And I remember when some of them went back to Iran and some stayed and the difference of how their lives changed. Those who went back after Khomeini and the others took over were suffered horrendously. And you can see what's still happening in Iran now and those who stayed in America and had a foretelling of what might happen have had very different lives. The sense of chance and good luck and judgment is how one chooses to live and one what one wants to do or not to do or how do you how do you try to preserve something of your values when you move back into a place that's of so such terrible consequences we've seen around the world recently is is something this work just provokes time and time again for me when I think about it I just I just think it's 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 going to really really matter in the long haul for major works like this to be seen. It's an operatic visually and it's in its scope and very Great. public. Great, Great comparison, Chuck. We have time if anyone in the audience has any final questions they want to put in the Q&A. Um, I will uh, tell our, our panelists one or two that have come in. Um, one question was, is can anyone speak to the connection um, between Harley's music and the creation of these collages, even if it's not intentional? Do you see any connections? Well, I'd like to say something about that because my wife and I worked very early on with Steve Reich, the great composer, and he allowed us to use his, his serial music in the first visual theater pieces we did. So I'm very familiar with a lot of minimalist composers. And I think Harley's work is again, very important. And it, and it brings with it these very stringent kind of moods that accompany uh, how he, he produced his music. It, it's not happy music. <laughs> it's music of sound under real duress is how I feel when I listen to it very often. Some of it's full of kind of shrieking almost. It, it's very, very interesting in its tonal and atonal aspects. I would add, I would add, Melissa, that in many ways, uh, Harley uh, was a highly trained musician, as you know, or I, we want people to know. He trained at uh, University of Illinois under the character of world, but I studied with the same music teacher that, that, as he did in high school. And the structure, the fundamental structure of Deep Vaga is very classical. And it's, as Steve mentioned, it's five tiles high, like a musical staff. It's in four basic sections, like a, and um, there are blank canvases throughout, which serve as the equivalent of a musical rest. Mm. Although it's a visual rest, and they're very effective because of the intensity of the collages, when you have a blank canvas, you tend to see the adjacent canvases more, even more clearly because it gives you that visual breather. So it, one, it's a key relationship. There's a fundamental musical structure of the, of the work. Mm, mm, well said, Dan. We have um, one other question in from the audience that I want to honor because we have just enough time to squeeze it in before we're going to give the mic back to Judy in about three minutes. It says, um, uh, Dan mentioned beauty in the work once earlier in this conversation. Um, the viewer would welcome further consideration of ways in which Gaber used beauty to bring viewers into gazing at even horrific things they otherwise might turn away from. And Gaber's notion of beauty, which seems indebted to earlier artists, such as John Hartfield and Hannah Hawk. So the, the, our viewer would like to hear more. If you would uh, give me uh, the chance to put up something that's on my screen. I love this question. This is a great question. I want to put up the headline from the first review of the first exhibit of the work. Is, you is can that share a screen. 
Can I do that? Okay. Here we go. It's a can you see this okay? Uh, not yet. Not yet. It says you're sharing. Here we go. Yeah. Jo Jonathan Seville was a, 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 a critic also. I think he was on the faculty at UC San Diego of the San Diego Reader, which was a terrific alternative weekly. Uh, it, it, and this review captured so much of the beauty dimension uh, that was uh, in, that, in that great question. And uh -huh. he, the, this critic, and I'll put the link to the review, uh, Amber, if you would post this after I send it to you, he talks about the question of whether something whose subject matter is horrific can be beautiful. And I think he talks about um, other works, uh, in, including uh, Bruegel's work uh, about uh, horrific things imagined and uh, the beauty that can make it possible for people to regard them. But I wanted to also add one other uh, answer to this question. I'm gonna stop sharing now, but I'll put the link in in just a minute. I also wanna add that uh, a book that Jock told me about by Andrea Liss talks about the, uh, in the difficulty and near impossibility of looking at things depicted that are horrible in photographic uh, records. And I think what Harley's done is made it possible to regard the interaction of people when the source imagery may be horrific, but the ability to look at it with a steady gaze has uh, been made possible because Harley's modified this work. Mm -hmm. So I think the creation of this, uh, of the things of th that are beautiful are possible because of the medium and the art, uh, mm -hmm the power of his artistic hand, and which is, by the way, Harley had no studio training, as far as I know, never took, uh, uh, had classical art education, no studio drawing, he couldn't paint. And um, he complained about this because he's been making two dimensional art for a long time and has had a lot of gallery exhibits, but all of it is done with craft, cra craft skill he had to develop uh, with, with care on his own over time. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Steve. That was that was so helpful in thinking more about this work. And I, I think that Harley would have been very glad to hear us wrestle with these questions. As, and as you brought up earlier, Harley is challenging us on purpose with this work and, um, and trying to get us to ask these difficult questions. Mm -hmm. So it is one minute before the top of the hour. I would like to thank the panelists for their wonderful, wonderful comments. It has been such a pleasure for me to get to know the work and get to know all of you. And for those of you viewing the program that have not yet seen the exhibit, please do. Um, while it is a little bit um, overwhelming, I can also tell you that the gallery is filled with light. And as we intend you to experience, you'll walk away with more light to shed. So Judy, please take it from there. I just wanna offer my utmost thanks to all of you. Melissa, thank you for stirring, stirring this panel. Jock, Steve, Dan, fantastic. I think that you really helped us understand the work both in context, but also why it is very relevant today. Mm -hmm. It is open through January 29th. We're at 724 Northwest Davis Street for anyone in Oregon who thinks they might have a chance to see it. And our opening hours are Wednesday through Sunday, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. And we hope you'll come visit and thank you one and all. And thanks everyone for joining us today. Look forward yeah. to seeing you soon. Yeah. Don't Bye. miss it. Do yeah, not don't miss it. it. Don't <laughs> miss it, right? Thank you everyone, really. Thanks so much. <laughs>